and I won't steal your thunder. This is all about VR and AR, but the idea here t today is to actually marry uh, sort of what the future could be, uh, but also some practicalities, right? So Keith, I'll hand it off to you, and you got plenty of time, so no need to rush. Okay, all right, well look, uh, hello everyone. I'm, I'm really sorry I can't be there. Uh, I know that tomorrow King, is King's Day, and you know, a night in Amsterdam, and then all the partying. I, I'd much rather be with you guys than back in the UK, where we're halfway through a junior doctor's strike, so it's not, it's not really much, as much fun. Uh, I'm going to try and do the technical bit just now, and uh, the notes that I've been getting on this is that I have to speak quite slowly. So if I speed up, I will try and bring it down. But here we go, I'm going to see if I can bring the slides up. Okay, and, and just wait a minute, I've just bought myself a brand new laptop and I've already got a spinning ball of death, but hold on a moment. I'll just try and come out of this and get the screen sharing going. Hang on a moment. Hey, the positive thing, we can actually hear you. All right, okay, that's good. Well, I'm just gonna try and get, uh, I just need to get the screen sharing going and then we're ready to rock. Uh, here we go. Where are we? Share screen. All right, okay, uh, so you should, you should be sharing the screen just around about now, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Alright, okay, the last part of the puzzle. I'm almost there. Uh, but I've gone a little further. There. And there you can see the little spinning beach ball. Okay. Alright, okay. So, I'll get started. Well, look, thank you again for inviting me. My name's Keith Grimes, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the practical role of VR and AR in primary care. Uh, and you know I would have been there in person, but you know, things happen sadly. Uh, so let's see if we can get on to the next slide. All right, so who am I? Well, uh, I am a GP and I am a geek. I have been a GP for 15 years, but I have been a geek for much, much longer. Um, I work in a walk-in center in Eastbourne, which is on the south coast of England, and I specialize in urgent primary care. Uh, it's the sort of thing that you go and see a doctor about, but quickly, but not so quickly of needing to go into hospital. And all the way through my career, from medical school, through my training, and in my work as clinical lead in urgent care, I've always tried to use consumer technology to help me in my day-to-day -day work. So I've kept patient notes on my Scion, and then I kept it on my Palm Pilot, and then I put it on my smartphone. And I've been a coder in my time, I've coded in JavaScript, Objective-C, even Visual Basic, all trying to automate my daily work and make it easier. And even in the last year, the team that I worked with was awarded with a People's Choice Award from NHS Scotland for a project called My Little One. And My Little One was a project where we used off-the-shelf components, we used iPads and web cameras, and we produced a secure system to allow parents to see their children in the neonatal intensive care unit when they couldn't be there. And that started up with about a six month window to get going. It's been running for 18 months, still running now. So we're quite pleased about this. And all of these are really simple, cheap, and practical solutions to the problems that I faced and I saw in my clinical work. So you can see why I think of myself as a digital healthcare innovator, and as a frontline healthcare hacker. Because my approach is to keep it simple, keep it cheap, and keep it practical. So I first became aware of VR uh, back in the early 90s, maybe with some of the yoga, you guys back there, introduced by the way of William Gibson's novel, Neuromancer, and augmented reality, I reckon, came about earlier when I watched The Terminator, and we saw the augmented reality there. Of course, back then, there was no shortage of amazing ideas for healthcare and VR. I mean, there were brilliant ideas. It's just that the technology was ripped poor, didn't keep up with it. And so we're about 25 years later now, it's no longer the case. I mean, this year we've seen the launch of the commercial versions of the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, and we've also got the Samsung Gear VR, we've got Google Cardboard. And the result of this is that now we're seeing a real public explosion in interest in VR and AR, and really big claims being made about the potential of VR and AR to help with new treatments for different conditions, from phobias, through stroke rehab, to managing chronic and acute pain. And not only is the evidence based so is the actual use of VR. Now, I believe earlier on you might have heard 
about the work of Shafi Ahmed. The Shafi I saw yesterday, actually, he's a surgeon based in London, and he did the live stream of a 360 video of an operation. And I saw him yesterday and stole a few of these off him, which I'll come back to a bit later on. And so thousands of people watched it, and you can imagine the benefits of medical training in hard to reach areas. Now, all of this is secondary care. Secondary care is very sexy medicine. You know, it's always expensive. It's always really high-tech stuff. That's where a lot of the money is spent. But it's not where most of the work is done. Most of the work is done in primary care. And that's where I work. Primary care is the engine room of healthcare. Primary care is the coalface. And in the UK, 90% of all NHS work occurs in primary care. And in 2014, to give you an idea of that, in, the UK, in England, 340 million consultations took place. All right, that's huge. And in, in the UK, in the same way as the Netherlands and most of the developed world, we're actually facing a number of pretty significant challenges. And that demand I tell you about, but rising 13% in the last six years, running up to those figures. And there's no sign of that slowing down. Workforce is changing. There's a falling number of doctors. They're either burning out, fading away, or just retiring. Patients that we see, they're older. They have more complex illnesses. And the treatment is more costly. Our premises, no, they're, they're old now. They're even they're having problems. They're not up to the task. Then we've got the economic and we've got the political issues. So we have the workforce striking. We've got the nurses potentially striking, ambulance drivers. In short, it's difficult times. Now, if you want to make a difference to global health, and I'm sure people here do, you need to do it in primary care. We need our technology to help quickly. We need them to help in a simple, cheap, and practical way. And so how can VR and AR do this? Well, there are lots of researchers working on it, but my philosophy, as you've said, I've said already, is to use the available technology and partner with patients to deliver benefit as quickly and simply as possible. I want to describe a couple of projects I'm working on at the moment to illustrate that. Okay, so I'm going to start by telling you about a patient I'm going to call John. Now, John, he's a great guy, he's in his 50s, sadly he's very overweight, he loves rugby. In fact, he kind of loves rugby so much that he avoided seeing a doctor pretty much his entire life until his health got in the way. I've been helping him since then. And one of the problems that John has is chronic leg ulcers. Now, I don't know how many medical people are in the audience, so I apologize if I over-explain some of this. But leg ulcers can be caused by a number of things, but they require regular dressing. And those regular dressings can be very, very painful. I mean, he's a prop, John is a prop ball. And if he complains of pain, you listen to him because he's had a painful life. Now, he was having dressing changes two or three times a week for months at a time. And so one day he said to me, oh, Doc, I wish there was something that could distract me, but they're changing these bloody bandages. And of course, at that point, I thought, well, yes, there is something that could distract you. There's my Samsung Gear VR. Um, and so we already know from research evidence that the Gear VR, um, VR sorry, can be very effective in pain. They're acute pain or chronic pain. So I started this, and I'm in the middle of it just now, I'm trying to get him to use the equipment. I've had him try the headset. I've had him select some uh, material to watch from the existing 60 videos out there. And as of next week, I'm going to start putting it on his, uh, on his, so he can wear it when he's having his dressing changes. And if that proves effective, I've got a presentation ready to demonstrate VR to the local wound healing center. And the wound healing center treats all of the patients in the locality who have chronic ulcers. And I'll be able to give them some cardboard headsets, again, easy to get hold of, and the patients can take them away. So this is simple, cheap, and practical virtual reality. I've got another patient. These are all genuine patients, I've just changed their name. Uh, let's call him Mike. Now, Mike is in his 70s, and the problem for Mike is that a few years ago he was having angiography for his heart disease, but he had a very, um, on routine complication. He had a, a, a tear of the angiography site, and as a result of that, he sadly lost his lower leg. He lost, got a below knee amputation. And since then, he's been suffering from burning pain and cramping pain in his foot. The thing is, the foot's no longer there, and that's phantom lip pain. And again, you may know what this is, but for those of you who don't, it's a very unpleasant complication, not that uncommon following amputations. Patients will experience quite severe pain, cramping, burning in their missing limbs. And they think that it's due to the central perception. And the reality for this patient, as well as many of them, is that you really cannot treat it with drugs, even strong drugs. Now, 
Research has already shown, and Ramakandran back in 96 found that simple discovery of using mirror therapy, where you place a mirror in the missing limbs, can actually significantly reduce pain and unpleasant sensations from the missing limbs. And that's been replicated in virtual reality as well. Now, if you look on the right side of the screen, it's the person you can see here, a patient, and that patient got, looks like a, just a slightly below elbow amputation. And they've got some electrodes in their hand, and this is from a study that was done showing that in this patient, the electrodes will simu uh, simulate the movement of the hand, which augments the effect as well. So this patient had serious, severe, ongoing pain, had persistent relief of pain thereafter. So currently there's no off-the-shelf solutions for this, and so I've been in contact with people through some Facebook, so I'm working with some developers in the UK and the US, to try and create some very simple, intact body experiences, which I'm going to be able to work with Mike share with him, again, using Google Cardboard probably, but he can use it on his own and take it away. And he can use it at night, where instead of having his wife wake up, rub ice over the stump and massage his other foot, he'll be able to try this as well. So this is a simple, cheap, practical piece of VR. I don't want to say miss out on augmented reality, but augmented reality clearly has a role to play. Now, my feeling with augmented reality is that at the moment it's slightly stuck in terms of tablets and smartphones which limits it a little bit. We've got HoloLens, Meta, and Magic Leap coming along. They probably put us at the point now that we were with Oculus Rift about two or three years ago, maybe more than that. As these developers get more immersive AR uh, mixed reality, and why I'm trying to, I've been trying to look at my consulting room and think what it is about the consultation in primary care that could be helped by augmented reality. Now, if any of you guys have gone to QPD, you'll probably have the same thing that we do, you'll come in and one of the major barriers is that you'll have a doctor, you'll have the patient, and then in between, you'll have a computer screen, sometimes literally in between. And that gets between, and that gets between. And the other thing is you probably don't get to see what's on the screen either. All of this hampers communication. I think augmented reality has a really important role to play there. I think augmented reality can provide a mutual space where information can truly be shared and develop a shared understanding of the information. So to that end, I'm currently working on two projects. Again, with local developers, developers I met yesterday in Brighton, in fact. But I'm also working with some of the big uh, developers of um, the GP clinical systems. In the UK, there are three, and one of them has got some uh, ideas about innovation. So I'm working with them, and we're going to be putting the, putting the hackers together with myself and these developers. The idea is that we'll be able to keep off a target image, a mouse map in the case, and with a tablet, I'll be able to sit next to the patient and I'll show them using augmented reality three-dimensional models of anatomy to give them not only a clear idea of normal anatomy, but be able to use some of the downloaded information from their scans so they can see their anatomy too. And what appears to be really powerful about the art, some of the best stuff that I've done so far with a non-medical side of things, is the effect of the, the effect of the object of the real world really drives out the message far better than a flat screen. And so again, Facebook, hacking events, I've met with developers, and I'm able to put this tech, these simple pieces of technology in front of patients to get feedback straight away. And you may already know about these, but even in my own practice, I've started to keep a list of patients, and they're waiting for the applications to be available for them. So I have patients with social anxiety disorder. I think Manisha earlier on would have told you about the Rico Theta 360. I'm thinking of being able to use that. Uh, you have patients with crowded space. The Corn 360 is a much quicker way of getting a, a realistic environment compared to rendering it in the virtual reality. The distraction therapy that we're using for my patient John with the wound th with the wound and dressing changes. We've got lots of patients with needle phobia if you have blood tests. This might help them. We've got patients with stress, anxiety and mental health disorders that would do well for mindfulness and meditation. And then there's patients that are isolated by physical or mental health problems or even just frailty in old age. Social VR, like old space VR, and uh, uh, Oculus Social Beta, I think it's called, uh, those environments are useful for people to come and meet in a new way. And then the final thing that I'm actually quite excited about, and I've got uh, an event on, well, it's at my local palliative care hospice, is that those patients that are frail, that are spent, virtual reality offers them the opportunity to travel the world and be freaked up from where they are right now. So, great, hey, well, go ahead, yeah. except in medicine, we have to first know harm. And so I'm going to be listing some of the problems 
that you're probably sometimes aware of that's worthwhile exploring a little bit more. Um, the first is simulation sickness, or big R sickness. And this has been around since flight simulators even before that. From a physiologic point of view, it's thought to be a disconnect between what you see and what you feel. We feel, or rather, acknowledgists, and um, I quote what was said on Periscope earlier on, actually, so even things like foveated VMR, all of these technologies will hopefully reduce that discrepancy between what you're perceiving and what you're feeling. And as a result of that, it should reduce simulation sickness. I was only just reading about it, there's not only, um, not only technological approaches that way, but Mayo Clinic has developed something called galvanic vestibular stimulation. So stimulation to help synchronize movement with what's being seen on the screen to reduce the likelihood of simulation sickness. When VR works, it conveys a very realistic environment, and so patients may be exposed to distressing environments. In fact, sometimes you want to be doing that anyway when it comes to uh, challenging them with their uh, phobias. But some patients may have actually adverse effects as a result of that, and that's what we call ab reaction. So, post traumatic stress disorder, increased social anxiety, and even what they've described as reintegration trauma, psychological damage and harm caused to patients who previously missing a link, seeing their body integrated again for the first time in some years. When it comes to infection control, I mean, I've been struck how little attention is paid to the most basic hygiene and infection control. If you guys have been to any conferences, I don't know how often you've just been going up and putting on a headset and passing it to someone else and passing it to someone else. One person has conjunctivitis. They've all got conjunctivitis. Now, healthcare, you can't just let them go. And so we have to develop good protocols and management. We need to get decent headsets. Down at the bottom right, I don't know if it's included for you as a headset for a company called Opto VR. They're doing a Google Cardboard style approach with integrated earphones. And what's really interesting about them is that their headset is closed cell phone, which allows you to keep it very clean. And then there's falls of injury. First time I used the HTC Vive, I smashed my friend light because I was shooting things in the air. And that's me, you know, I'm fine. But it doesn't take much to imagine. Uh, an older person, a frail person, falling over, breaking a wrist, breaking a hip, you know, hurting themselves. I think that there are ways around this, but for now we're going to need some chaperoning. And then, of course, worries about security, confidentiality, equity of access, cost. These are all important. But the important thing is that we're facing such huge challenges that the appetite is there for a change. People are more willing to try risks. I mean, I consider myself an early adopter, obviously, but I'm seeing a much more appetite for innovative approaches in my colleagues and nurses as well. So if you want to be part of this and you want to help people, you're going to want to do it in primary care. And the other bit of good news is that it's actually money for this, at least in the UK. Uh, last week, uh, the Chief Forward View, which is a five-year forward view about the funding in general practice, was published. And this shows a commitment over the next five years to increase funding in primary care by 2.4 billion pounds a year, an increase. And that is with an emphasis on improving workforce premises, but specifically ways of working and specifically technology. So there's a very sort of fertile environment and there's potentially going to be money in there as well. And so my vision for VR and AR memory began with being a user, just like I'm sure lots of you. It's just really exciting. It's really interesting. It's fascinating. But it's much, more, it's much more interesting to know that VR and AR, they're not just rules that just replicate what we're doing right now, because in fact they probably get in the way of all the things we're doing right now. It's actually much more interesting to think about the things that we can do better, differently. And so I appeal to everyone there to, this is my appeal to you, speak with patients, speak with your doctors, speak with nurses, get to know exactly what the environment is in primary care, what the problems are. We will happily shift this back. Use the tools that are available to you right now. Simple tools like Google Cardboard, um, Samsung Gear VR, content that's out there. Get VR and AR in front of clinicians and patients. Experiment with what's going on. Do it in a safe way, and then share your findings with the, with the wider community. Raise the profile. And then I think in truth, VR's big time is possibly still a little way off. AR may even a bit further too. But I reckon it's going to be the public that are going to be coming to us asking why we aren't cheating them if we care. And so, just as I wrap up and before I take any questions, you may be wanting to know how you can find out more. Um, I've set, uh, set up a Facebook group, 
ER doctors, you're very welcome to come and join that. It's not just myself, there are other doctors working in here in the US. There's also developers and other interested parties. And there's a Twitter, uh, Twitter address to go with this. In the UK, there are organizations that can help you as well. Uh, the Academic Health and Science Networks are publicly fund funded. There are 15 of them around the UK uh, or in England. And they exist specifically to bring together education, healthcare, researchers, and industry to foster innovation. And in Scotland, there is the equivalent called the Digital Health and Care Institute, the HI. And in fact, they're the people that worked with my team to deliver my little one, the successful project cut. And of course, you've got the hack days, the NHS has its hack days. The next hack day is coming up, it's on the 14th and the 15th of May, and it's in London. And it's free to attend, and I'll be there. I went to the first one about 18 months ago, there was one VR hack. The last couple took four or five. I do not doubt that there will be many, many, many more this time. And of course, you can look at my website, I try and blog about it when I can, when I'm not seeing patients. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter. And I'm always very happy to answer any questions that approach us and share what I consider to be reality and problems of healthcare and primary care. Um, and then just to finally say, look, I think we are standing on the brink of a really amazing new form of communication. And because communication is such an important part of primary care, we're standing on the brink of a really important new form of therapy. As the technology develops, I think the distinction between VR, AR, and mixed reality will go. And right now, it feels a little bit like we've been inside a room and we've been interacting with the world through just a panel, through a square. I think VR and AR are basically allowing a door, a door to go out, step, and see the outside world, and be there and share it with patients. And I think that is the most amazing prospect of VR and AR in primary care. So, thank you for listening. I hope it was quick. Yep. Uh, very happy to answer any questions that allow you to get out and uh, enjoy Amsterdam. I'm sure there's going to be tons.